we're talking about the uncontrollable sin. And by now, we're aware that that sin is coveting. And we've said a couple of things about coveting as we kind of establish a foundation. Um, number one is that coveting counts. It's Jesus that made coveting count again. It's one thing to control behavior. It's another thing to control thoughts and attitudes, but when Jesus sets the bar for what it means to be a follower, he raises the bar, not just to the place that we not only have to control what we do, but what we think. Uh, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. He said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If we control our behavior, but not our thoughts, we end up in the same line as somebody who committed murder or adultery. Coveting counts, but as well, even more disturbing. Coveting is uncontrollable. Um, so Paul says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. When you put law on a person and tell them that you'll be blessed if you do this and cursed if you don't. That actually stimulates the very behaviors the law is prohibiting. When it says, do not covet, and if you covet, you'll be cursed, that will not allow us to control coveting. It uh, what really causes coveting to be uncontrollable. So here's the question. How do we strike at the root of the uncontrollable sin? And we talked about doing five things. And we're at the fourth of those. Number one is be real. We have to be honest about the things that we deal with inside. That's fundamental. If we apply promises, but really don't dial in what we actually think and feel, it doesn't really help us very much. That's why number one is be real. Then be still. Uh, we talked about the word be still from Psalm 46. Let your arms hang limp at your side. It's a very unnatural posture, especially when things are going crazy. We always want to be doing something with our hands. And what God says, there will come a time for doing something, but not first. Be real be still, and then speak freely. And come to the throne of grace. We talked about the word, it's parousia. And it's the freedom that a Roman citizen had to enter the chambers of individuals in authority, and not only to speak, to enter the chambers, but to speak freely when they enter. They were expected to. That's what God tells us to do. Be real be still, enter the throne of grace, speak freely. And he says that if we do, if we enter the throne of grace with confidence, we will receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Then fourth, what we'll talk about today, be real, be still, speak freely, and it opens the door to the last two. So I want us to understand the first three of these are pivotal and foundational. Be real, be still, speak freely. Practice that. It's not natural. Practice it. It's like developing a muscle. And if you do, you'll find on the far side of that the ability to wait perseveringly and respond gently. Let's think about the fourth of those, wait perseveringly. If you are exposed to the Bible for the first time, somebody hands you a Bible, you haven't seen it before, and tells you page through and just start noticing what it focuses on. It won't be very long before you focus and notice the word faith. 
Faith is all over the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. As you try to find a thread that characterizes what faith does, here's what you're going to discover from the Bible. Now, this is a little bit strange because it's not always what we hear. Faith waits. That's what you're going to find. If you tune into the Bible carefully, you're going to discover that faith waits. Um, it isn't commonly heard. It's inescapable nonetheless. To live by faith is to wait perseveringly. This is found in both sections of the Bible. To turn the Bible into a magic wand to get what we want. To see faith as kind of a magic wand of sorts is to disregard the basic teaching of the Bible with respect to what God wants for us. Look what it says. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. I want you to take a look at that verse. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Can we make an assessment about what the will of God means? We can. It involves perseverance. As we learn to persevere, that's what God wants from us. And on the far side of persevering, we're able to get what we promise. Um, this is in the letter to the Hebrews, and they had had to endure all kinds of things. Um, he reminds them, the writer of Hebrews, that the will of God involves the need for perseverance. And we might ask the question, why did they need to be reminded? Because of the influence of a bunch of difficulties. They received promises. And after receiving the promises, they got a bunch of difficulties that they had to deal with. Um, what it says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you, your, you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. The impact of chronic difficulties eroded their confidence. It was one thing in the beginning of their Christian life. Sympathize with those in prison, joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. They hung together. It was the very beginning. But what ended up happening as the years went by, you know, if I had the thing, you know, the calendar years and the calendar pages are flying off the calendar and one year turns into five. This letter is probably 15 to 20 years after they became Christians in Israel and most of them were pushed out of Israel into the Roman Empire. This is about a decade to two decades later. And when they left, they were newly married or had young families. And now they're not newly married anymore. They have moved into the Roman Empire, where as Jewish Christians, they weren't accepted by Gentiles because they were Jews. They weren't accepted by Jews because they were Christians. They were people without a country. And it was one thing in the very beginning, but now their kids are grown up. They had, they're without neighborhood and without livelihood. Now, maybe it was one thing for them to tough it out, but now their kids, their, their kids, the ability of their kids to get a good job is, is nil. What's happening? He is appealing to them to hang in there. They want to ditch this, leave the church, go back to what they knew. And here's what he says. Do not throw away your confidence. It will, it will be richly rewarded. The word for confidence there, it's the same word for when it talks about approaching the throne of grace with confidence, that parousia word, entering into the chambers, speaking freely. You know what God wants of us? When we are pushed by difficult circumstances, he wants us to come and, it's not going to be surprising, be real, be still and speak freely. What he says, and I want us to point that out, 
your confidence will be richly rewarded when we are real with God and when we take a moment to be still and speak freely with him that is what is rewarded remember in the old well when they were leading the Israelites out of Egypt in the first year when they were out um, God exposed them to hunger we're going to talk about that in just a minute and thirst and hunger, and they were got into one difficult place after another. You know, they walked across the Red Sea on dry land, and they were just like moonwalking. It was just great. You know, they said, this is, you know, that we're going through. And then, then the Egyptians went through, and they got drowned. And so they felt, hey, we're, we're good. But it's, it's really just two or three days journey from the Red Sea to the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they then were put in situations where they were afraid that they were going to lose their life. And so the first year, when he's going, what God tells Moses, okay, here's what I want you to do. You come into a place where there's no water, I want you to hit the rock, hit the rock. And Moses did, hit the rock. And water came out of it. And that happened time and time and time and time again. Okay, let's, let's let the, the calendar pages come off. Five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 39. So in the 39th year, they're back in this place. And here's what God says. Speak to the rock. And it will produce water for you. Remember what Moses did? Did he speak to the rock? Hit it. You know what? It's hard to speak to God about our frustrations. It's easier to hit somebody. It's easier to hit yourself. No matter I'm frustrated, I'm... Doom, doom. It's easy to hit somebody else. No matter I'm frustrated, look who I have. Bam, bam. Or hit. The hard thing to do is to be real with God. God, I'm discouraged. I'm frustrated. I'm afraid. I feel disconnected. I feel alone. I feel hopeless. I feel powerless to be real and to be still and to think about what he says. I am God. I will be exalted in the nations and on the earth. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you be real be still speak freely God I don't know if I can hang on when we're real and we're still and we speak freely that is richly rewarded and if God gives a thumbs up it's when we do that your confidence your parousia will be richly rewarded this is not something we're going to learn overnight but it is something that God commands of us. Be real, be still, speak freely. Because as you're doing to do those three, what you're going to find on the far side of that, the ability to, I want you to listen to me. If you learn to be real, be still, and speak freely, like building a muscle, you're going to find that the ability to wait perseveringly and respond gently just starts to happen the way it works. You don't have to force it. You don't have to. It's the first three steps that are the important ones. The first three steps. We end up receiving mercy and finding grace to help. And again, just so you know, it's really, it really isn't easy to learn. Some of us, it's really hard to be honest. We're not taught to be honest with God. We're supposed to, oh, <laughs> thanks God. I love, love what you did with the planet. <laughs> And, and you might not really feel like you like what he did with the planet. Sometimes we're so busy, we don't take time to just sit. It's interesting, we've talked about this before. Um, we naturally tell ourselves, don't just sit there, do something. You know what God says? <laughs> we've talked about this. Don't just do something, sit there. Talk to me. Be real, be still, speak freely. Hard to learn. It's what he wants and it's what he rewards. Um, it says, do not throw away your confidence. 
It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. You know what it means to live by faith? To live by faith means to learn to wait for what God promises to come to pass. Wait. Waiting. Faith waits. Um, encourages them, this writer, to wait for God. More challenging um, when your kids are growing up. One thing to, for you to wait, another thing to make your kids wait, or them to get the promises as well. Uh, the ability to wait is Christ-like, what it says. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. When you read <laughs> hunger, hunger isn't very reasonable. You know, you grow up, it becomes a little more reasonable. But when, but when we're young and when we're really hungry, 40 days hungry, that wouldn't be a reasonable hunger. We want to get rid of hunger now. That's what we want when we're hungry. It all depends what we're hungry for, food or power or love. We want it now. Hard to wait for that. Um, this is the target of temptation, the elimination of hunger. Jesus is 40 days in, and he is desperately hungry. And hungry is not, it's not a patient experience. All three temptations have this in common. We're not going to spend a lot of time, but we'll notice all three temptations have this in common. Relief now. Not needing to wait. Look what it says. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, as It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Eliminate the physical need. Satisfy the need. If you satisfy the need, what happens? Relief. Now. Um, Jesus says, No. So he sticks with it. He doesn't. Well, you know what he does. What does he do? He exercises faith. He waits. He knows God's going to meet his need. And he waits. Faith waits. It goes on, though. It says, uh, Jesus, then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put your Lord, the Lord your God, to the test. The first is eliminate the physical need. Make bread. The second, eliminate the emotional need. You might feel a little bit nervous, Jesus. Jesus, God said he was going to meet your needs, but 40 days and God hasn't really brought any food, has he? You know, I guess maybe, maybe do this then. Put yourself on the top of the temple, Throw yourself down. God will pick you up, and you'll be you'll know that God loves you. And um, this is about eliminating the the emotional need. If the first is satisfying the need, this is silencing it. Silence the need. Um, and Jesus says no. Then finally, uh, he. Here we go. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Overwhelm the need with human applause. Have the word idolize you. And that's the, uh, seemed the gist of this. Submerge the need. A couple things you can do with the need. You can satisfy it. You can silence it. You can submerge it with the smile and the applause of the crowd. Uh, Jesus' faith, I want you to, and if you, if you come up with anything from this, this is what I want us to remember. Jesus' faith did not allow him to eliminate the hunger. It, allow, it allowed him to endure it. God tells us to do things. You know what he tells us? Be real, be still, and speak freely. And the reason why we do those things, be real, be still, and speak freely, 
is not to eliminate tension. It's to endure it. Sometimes we we think that if I'm real and I'm still and I speak freely with God, I should feel wonderful afterwards. I shouldn't feel tense anymore. I've fallen into this a bunch of times. And it it makes you think about, well, there's something wrong. This this clicker is working. So if I try to click it and and it's and and I it wasn't working, I'd, I'd hit it, you know. <laughs> and sometimes we do that with our faith. Well, if I had enough faith, I shouldn't feel tension, right? I shouldn't feel tension. And when we reel and we're still and we speak freely and we're still nervous, we end up used to doing like this to our faith. You know, <laughs> you know, is there something wrong with it? No, there's nothing wrong with it. The reason why we are to be real, be still, and speak freely is not to eliminate the tension. The tension is real. There's things that are happening. There's relationships that are that are that are evolve, dissolving, and it's what God doesn't want you to, to pretend. He wants you to be real and be still and speak freely and honestly about what's happening. And as you do these things, you won't move the tension. It's a little bit easier to deal with tension when you feel seen and heard. And that's what he offers. What he offers you? A hand. So you can touch the thing that's difficult for you to deal with and to touch his hand at the same time. And you know what this does? Allows you to endure a little bit easier. It's a, it's a, but you know what this is? What this is? Holding the reality of what you're dealing with and holding God's hand? This is faith. This is faith. That's what it means. And the ability to do so grows over time, not quickly. And it requires that you deal with hunger. Hunger and tension. Um, the evidence of faith. The verse talks about, in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. And it just has one faith person after another. And it, it makes this statement about them. Um, it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things prompt. Wait a minute. No, that must be that must be the wrong version. Um, they were living by faith when they died, and they didn't receive the things promised. That must be a typo. Shane, is that a typo? Uh, not a typo. Well, that's strange. I thought faith allowed you to get things. I didn't know that faith allowed you not to get things. But that's what it says. All these people were living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things promised. And you know what they still continue to do? Be real, be still, speak freely. Be real, be still, speak freely. And they were waiting perseveringly. And they were still waiting when they died. Now, did they get their reward? Yeah. But it came on the far side of the grave. Uh, They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. That this earth wasn't their home. Do you know why you're frustrated at some deep level? And you're saying, oh, I'm not frustrated. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're hungry. You don't have what you want to have. It doesn't mean you don't have anything, but not enough to make you absolutely content. You don't do what you want to do. You don't think what you want to think. Some of you wake up and you don't like your thoughts when you wake up. You don't feel what you want to feel. And we tend to think that, well, there's something wrong. You know what's wrong? You're not home yet. You're an alien and a stranger. Your father lives in another place. And when we get there, but he he gives us three words that kind of make a welcome, admit, long. They welcomed God's promises from afar. They admitted they were aliens and strangers, and they longed for a better country. They longed to be home. And that allowed them to, what? Wait. It allowed them to wait. I'm not home yet. I can wait. I'm not home yet. 
Faith waits. It's critically important to understand this, and it's also important to understand that faith waits and emotions don't. Emotions don't wait. Um, it says, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses. And that what happens? When you can't wait, what do you do? You hit somebody. Quarrel, grumble, frism, rism, frism, rism, rism, frism, rism. It's my fault I don't have what I want. Or your fault I don't have what I want. It's his fault I don't have. We grumble, grumble, frism. And so that's what they were doing. You know, when you feel emotions, then grumbling comes along. Find somebody to blame. Some of us are more apt to blame ourselves. Some of us are more apt to blame others. Some of us blame him. But we blame someone, and this is what ends up happening. Uh, they quarrel with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. Emotions demand relief now. Emotions aren't patient. Faith waits, emotions don't. Um, Again, they're in a difficult spot. They have a life-threatening need, and they, they need to have their hunger met or they're going to die. But it is interesting, isn't it? They grumble and complain. And Do you remember when we last joined Jesus in the wilderness? Remember the thing you never heard from his mouth? Grumbling, complaining. Again, we're not Jesus. But that is in stark contrast, isn't it? Faith allows us to be real about our thirst, and as we learn, to be less grumbly with other people. It's easy, it's a little bit easier to be not grumbly when, when you understand that faith waits. But again, would you agree with me? This is not a, this is not a lesson you're going to learn overnight and be able to have strong faith tomorrow. Faith is like a muscle. It grows with exercise. And day after day, be real, be still, speak freely. Day after day, day after day, little by little, little by little, your capacity to be real, be still, and speak freely grows. And you find yourself being able to wait perseveringly a little bit more and, and respond gently. The emotions that rise from chronic need are intense. The word, the Latin word for emotion comes from the Latin emotere. E, motore, motore, motor, what gets us moving. Emotions are good at propelling us to do something, and they're vital. Um, emotions catalyzed by frustrated desires demand immediate gratifications. Emotions are a little bit like having whiny kids in the back seat. I'm not looking at any kids now, and you know, specific kids. They're, so I want you to think you're, you're driving the car, and then there's a couple whiny kids in the back seat. I see some moms smiling. Um, and there's a couple things you do. I want to stop. I'm hungry. And, and there's a couple things you can't do, you know. Okay, you drive the car. <laughs> you know, okay. If you want to, you know, you can't give the kid the wheel. So emotions are like that. They cry out, but we can't give emotions the wheel. We can't let them direct the car. But would you agree with me? On the other hand, you wouldn't let one of your kids grab the wheel? And another response, okay, open the door, throw them out. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you what you want. You, you can't do that either. You can't, you do, they, they don't get ditched. Um, what do you do? Sometimes it can work. <laughs> Not NyQuil. I wasn't going to say NyQuil. Boy, boy, that sounds like an awful cough. You know, <laughs> here, take this. Um, no, it's, it, it's what you can do. You can turn and, and say, okay, honey, I know you're hungry. We're going to stop in just a little while. And you know what that does? It kind of soothes the knee, soothes the knee. They feel heard, They're able to speak able to identify. Uh, it's natural when we're driven by desires to assume that we need more self-control. Our ability to be patient 
we naturally assume that's a control issue. I need to learn to control my desires. You cannot control coveting to the degree that it will satisfy God. Can't. Have to learn another strategy. You know what that other strategy is? That's not control. You know what that is? Look at this says. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. This is the new covenant. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. I have a question. Is that control-oriented or contact-oriented? Does he promise control here or connection? This is really important to tack down. This is the solution. So the one thing about having the solution is that then you can figure out the problem. Would you agree with me? I'm going to put my law in your mind and write it on your heart. That's connection. Would you agree with me? I'm going to cause you to know me. That's connection. I am never going to fail or forsake you. I am going to, I'm never going to let your sin be a barrier between us. I would suggest that's 100% connection-oriented. 100%. You know what God does in order to help us manage our covenant? Be real, be still, speak freely. He says, you know what? I'm never going anywhere. I am connected with you with an irreversible connection. You know what I want you to do? To be real with me and to be still and to speak freely. And as you do so, what you're going to be able to do is wait perseveringly and respond gently because the deal with dealing with coveting, don't rely on control. Rely on contact this way and this way, little by little. Let's stand for closing prayer. God, you... Yeah. Emotions, and we all have them. They demand instant gratification. We grow up and we learn to delay gratification. But we still resent having to do so. We feel remorse because we think if we were better people. And we blame ourselves. We blame others. And apparently, you say... Building faith is something that is what you would have your children do. You put them in places where, well, we become hungry. And you want to teach us, don't hit the rock, or the husband, or the wife, or the government. Don't hit, but speak to the Father. Be real. Be still. Speak freely with Him. Learn to do that. And you tell us that as we learn to do so, we'll develop gradually the ability to wait perseveringly and respond gently. We create the ability to grow stronger faith because faith waits. In Jesus' name, amen.